The autonomic nervous system is that nervous system, as you know, that controls all physiological processes that don't require conscious input, respiration, cardiovascular function, digestion, uh, endocrine function, immune function. You know, I don't have to think about breathing, hopefully. You know, it's going to happen automatically. I mean, I can input and, and control the rate of breathing, but I don't have to. It'll happen automatically. I don't have to think about my heart beating. It happens automatically. I don't have to stand here, whoops, stand there saying, please beat, please beat, please beat. You know, it happens automatically. Yes, in terms of food, we make conscious decisions about what food we're going to eat, what our proclivities and dislikes are. But once it gets in the mouth and stomach, we don't have to think about the release of amylase in the mouth, the release of hydrochloric acid, pepsin in the stomach, the release of the pancreatic digestive juices, the proteolytic protein digesting, amylases that break down complex carbohydrates, lipases that break down triglycerides, the release of bile and bicarbonate from the liver. Remember, the liver has two main functions. It's a detoxification organ. That's where environmental chemicals and drugs and synthetic chemicals are processed and neutralized, prepared for excretion. It's also a digestive organ. It produces bile necessary for the absorption of fats. Um, we don't have to think about peristalsis. It happens automatically. We don't have to think about endocrine function, fortunately. I don't have to think about my thyroid or my adrenals releasing hormones. It happens automatically according to the needs in any particular moment. We don't have to think about immune function. Hopefully, when a bacteria, virus, or fungus attacks us, our immune system without conscious input does what it needs to do. Now, the word autonomic was actually coined by Langley at the University of Cambridge 100 years ago. It was a play on the words automatic. These are processes that don't require conscious input that happen automatically. Now, as you'll recall, and as you guys know, because you study neurophysiology, the, the autonomic nervous system, we're going to review this briefly, consists of two branches, sympathetic, parasympathetic. And they have their own unique anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and their own effects on all the tissues, organs, and glands. Now, the autonomic nervous system, if you simplify it, basically innervates two kinds of cells, secretory and smooth muscle. You know, smooth muscle is the cells that line all our organs, like the, the lower part, the upper part of esophagus, striated muscle, lower part, smooth muscle, stomach, small and large intestine, all lined with smooth muscle. That's how peristalsis occurs. The linings of ducts, like in the pancreatic ducts, lined with smooth muscle, and that's how the pancreas pumps out the enzymes into the duodenum. The liver's ducts are lined with smooth muscle. That's, it, that's how secretory glands, that's how tubular organs, like the intestinal tube, function through smooth muscle. Secretory cells produce and secrete the various hormones, enzymes, like pepsin and hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the pancreatic enzymes, insulin and the beta cells of the pancreas, bile from the uh, liver, uh, the mucus that lines the intestinal tract, thyroid, adrenal hormones. They're produced by secretory cells, and autonomic, the autonomic nervous system innervates all these secretory and, and smooth muscle cells. You know, I always say in, in medical school, they try and take simple things and make them complex, and take complex things and try and make them incomprehensible when they should be taking the incomprehensible and making it simple. But they don't do that. The autonomic nervous system basically innervates two kinds of cells. How simple can you be? Smooth muscle and secretory cells. Now, the sympathetic and parasympathetic work together in every minute of our lives to try and adjust our physiology and biochemistry to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. And they tend to work in opposition, as you'll recall. And they have their own, again, you need anatomy, physiology, biochemistry. We'll briefly look at the sympathetic system just to review this. The centers of the sympathetic nervous system begin in the posterior hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, you know, the pituitary stalk comes off the hypothalamus, kind of in the back of the nose. Hypo means under the thalamus. Posterior hypothalamus has the original centers for the sympathetic system, which through interneurons go down into the brainstem, brainstem medulla pons midbrain, where you have nuclei, the nuclear tractus talus solitarius, nucleus ambiguous. From there, the sympathetic neurons go down the lateral sides of the spinal cord. They're all, they're all symmetric. And they exit between the first thoracic vertebral body and the third lumbar vertebrae, and then go to all the secretory cells in the body, the secretory and smooth muscle cells. Now, when the sympathetic system fires, it has very exact, precise effects on all the target tissues. For example, in the eyes, as you guys know, in the sympathetic fires, you get pu pu pupillary dilatation, which increases the input of eye, actually increases distant vision. In terms of respiration, it increases, enhances the efficiency of respiratory exchange, the release of carbon dioxide, the absorption of oxygen. When the sympathetic system fires, the bronchi relax, the alveoli become more efficient in respiratory exchange, increases the efficiency of respiration, increases the efficiency of heart function, increases heart rate, the strength of cardiac contractility, cardiac output, and has very specific effects on the peripheral vasculature. In the skin, as you recall, it causes vasoconstriction, and it shuts down the entire blood input into the gut. You know, the gut is a reservoir of blood, a lot of arterioles and arteries and venules and veins that, that go into and lead out of the gut. Well, in the sympathetic system, far as all the arteries and arterioles that feed into the gut from the mouth to the anus shut down, which may not seem like a smart thing to do. There's a reason. The blood supply to the muscles, on the other hand, opens up, 
and the blood supply to the brain opens up. So it basically shunts blood from the skin and the gut to the muscles and to the brain. We'll see why that's a good thing in a minute. When the sympathetic system fires, not only does it shut down blood supply into the gut, but it basically shuts down all digestive function, the release of amylase from the mouth, pepsin hydrochloric acid from the stomach, the various pancreatic juices, both the endocrine and exocrine excretion from the pancreas. You know, the pancreas has the exocrine component, which produces the digestive enzymes, the proteolytic, amylytic, lipolytic, but also the hormones like glucagon and insulin. Shuts that down when it fires. Shuts down liver function both the detoxification aspects of liver function as well as the digestive bile salt producing aspects of liver function. Shuts it down, shuts down peristalsis. Peristalsis, when the sympathetic system fires, just turns off. On the, in the endocrine system, however, the completely different effect, it stimulates endocrine function, the release of thyroid hormone from the thyroid, adrenal hormones from the adrenal. Now, thyroid hormone is catabolic. It causes the breakdown of stored proteins, fats, and carbohydrates and converts them into usable energy. The adrenal hormones do the same. They're catabolic. There are over 100 different adrenal hormones I've read. But basically, they, they break down stored protein, fats, and carbohydrates, convert them into usable energy. Also, the adrenal hormones cause the retention of salt, and retention of water, and raise blood pressure. When the sympathetic system fires, it basically shuts down immune function, which again may not seem like a smart thing to do, but there's a reason. As you recall from first year physiology and biochemistry, this and, and, uh, neuroanatomy, the sympathetic system is the classic stress nervous system, and it's perfectly designed to help us deal with stress. In a time of stress, whether it's major or minor, you know, stress can be psychological, physiology, it can, physiological, it can be spiritual, it can be major and minor. During the day, we're always in a state of stress, whether we're caught at a stoplight, whether we're caught in traffic, whether a kid doesn't come home from school on time, whether we have to do a presentation, deal with a difficult employee, difficult relative. All those things are stressful, whether it's psychological or physical, extreme physical stress, having to run away from an earthquake or a house that's burning or from a car crash. That's an extreme example where the sympathetic system turns on. And it's perfectly designed to help us deal with stress. And it has an innate capacity to turn on slightly or enormously, depending on the nature of the stress. For example, you have to run away from a car. You don't care if you're digesting your food from the last meal. You want blood going to the brain so you can think fast. Brain weighs two and a half pounds, uses 25% of all the body's energy. It is extremely metabolically active. In a time of stress, you have to make decisions very quickly. You don't care if you're digesting last night's pizza. You want the blood going to your brain, carrying with it oxygen and nutrients. So the gut shuts down, blood goes to the brain, also to the muscles. When the sympathetic system fires, blood goes to the muscles. So in a time of stress, you have physiological strength. We all read about stories where some kid was caught under a car and someone lifts up the car and, of course, could never do that again. And it's not mysticism. In a, in a state of extreme sympathetic firing, there's so much blood and oxygen going to the muscles, our strength improves like an incredible hulk enormously. So the sympathetic nervous system is expressly and beautifully designed to help us deal with stress. De being alive during the day is stressful from the time we get up to the time we go to bed. The sympathetic system tends to be alive, tends to be active during the day to help us deal with stress, whether it's minor or major, making a presentation, dealing with traffic again. It's always on converting protein to fat, breaking down tissues to provide energy for the brain, for the muscles. Parasympathetic system has its own unique anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and its own unique effect on the different tissues and organs. You know, in the eyes, it causes vasoconstriction, reduces eye, eye input of light. In the respiratory system, it causes bronchoconstriction and reduces the efficiency of exchange for oxygen and carbon dioxide. We'll say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense that you want that to happen, but there's a reason why that's a good thing. So it reduces the efficiency of respiratory exchange. It slows heart rate, slows the strength of cardiac contractility, reduces cardiac output, causes vasodilation in the skin and in the gut. Blood flows into the gut. Blood flows into the skin. You get all this blood pooling in the gut, it lowers blood pressure. So when the parasympathetic system fires, blood pressure tends to go down. When the parasympathetic system fires, all aspects of digestion are turned on. The release of amylase in the mouth, the release of pepsin hydrochloric acid in the stomach, the release of all the various pancreatic digestive juices, insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas, bile from the bicarbonate from the liver, the, digest, the, the detoxification aspects of liver physiology are enhanced enormously. Peristalsis increased. The breakdown, absorption, utilization, assimilation of nutrients increases exponentially when the parasympathetic system fires. When the parasympathetic system fires, however, endocrine function tends to be suppressed, both thyroid and adrenal function. When thyroid and adrenal function are suppressed, instead of breaking down stored proteins, fats, and carbs, we tend to store them. So parasympathetic system enhances the efficiency of digestion, enhances the absorption of nutrients, and then it stores them, and basically allows for the repair, rebuilding, and restoration of tissues. When the parasympathetic system fires, it stimulates immune function, particularly the immune function against bacteria and certain cancers. 
Now these are all, you know, things that we all learn in physiology. When Pottinger was delineating this in a wonderful book he wrote called Symptoms of Visceral Disease, first edition, 1919, it went through six editions. Last, there it is, last edition was 1944. It was a brilliant book, 426 pages of dense neuroanatomy, which I happen to like, but it's not easy reading. And in this book, through his six editions, he really delineated the anatomy, physiology, and biochemistry of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system and how they work. But he was not just an esoteric ivory tower scientist. He was the scion of a great medical family had several sons that were doctors. They ran a very successful, very good clinic. And he saw thousands of patients as a clinician. Of course, he was interested scientifically in the autonomic nervous system, so he was very keen, very astute about that. And he noticed in his practice, and this I promise will come to how we treat patients, you know, 70, 80 years later, that certain people in his practice seemed to have an overly developed, overly efficient, efficient sympathetic nervous system and correspondingly a weak parasympathetic system. Now, in the hypothalamus, there are interneurons between the anterior and posterior hypothalamus. The anatomy of the parasympathetic begins in the anterior hypothalamus, goes down through four of the cranial nerves, you know, the 12 cranial nerves the the, the, exit the skull, the ocular motor, glossopharyngeal, facial, and vagus all have parasympathetic output. And the vagus nerve goes through the chest, feeds the lungs and the heart, through the diaphragm, the upper digestive system, including the liver and the pancreas, the colon. And then there are other neurons that go down the spinal cord and exit the sacral plexus and feed the lower part of the digestive system, the, the bladder, the gonads, and the vessels in the, in the, in the legs. It has its own particular anatomy. And in the hypothalamus, the Parasympathetic neurons begin in the anterior hypothalamus, the interneurons that go between the anterior and posterior hypothalamus, and they're mutually inhibitory. So when the anterior hypothalamus fires, it suppresses the posterior sympathetic hypothalamus. When the sympathetic posterior hypothalamus fires, it inhibits the anterior. So they're mutually inhibitory. And what Pottinger realized, certain people in his practice had a very strong sympathetic system and a weak parasympathetic system, and correspondingly and logically all the tissues, organs, glands, in these people, and he thought it was genetically determined from birth, in these people all the tissues, organs, glands normally stimulated by their overly strong sympathetic system tend to be very highly developed and efficient respiration, cardiovascular function, endocrine function. And all the tissues, organs, and glands normally stimulated by their weak parasympathetic, including all of the digestion from mouth to anus, including liver and pancreas function, tended to be very inefficient and ineffectual. Now, these people had a very distinct psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. He studied them. He studied thousands of what he called these sympathetic dominants with a strong sympathetic system. Again, this wasn't environmental. He believed this was genetically determined. They had a very unique psychology, which was the result of their strong sympathetic system. You know, their stress system was turned on 24 hours a day. The first thing is they didn't sleep well. We, we always know people who sleep four or five hours a day, never sleep restfully, and yet run corporations and work 14-hour days. That's because their stress nervous system is turned on, sometimes less, sometimes more, but 24 hours a day, and parasympathetic system very weak. Because of this uh, overload of norepinephrine and adrenaline, the main neuro, uh, sympathetic neurotransmitters, they tend to be very prone to aggression. They, they tend to make good leaders, military leaders, trial lawyers, they're the sympathetic dominance. Who else would do that? Um, they tend to be very intellectual. They always blood go into their brain, so they make good mathematicians, good business people. They can think uh, intellectually. Not necessarily very creative, but they tend to be very smart. They spend their whole life with blood and oxygen going to their nutrients. Um, they, tend to have very, they tend to have very strong respiratory function, very efficient respiratory exchange, so they make good long-distance runners. These are the people that like to jog, like Dean Ornish, who's a classic sympathetic dominant. They like to jog. They, first of all, jogging burns off the extra norepinephrine and epinephrine, which is kind of irritating the body. They always feel agitated, kind of irritable. Um, they like to jog also. They have good respiratory exchange, so they can jog 26 miles and not think about it. They have good cardiovascular function, strong cardiac output. Blood tends to shunt from the skin to the gut, to the muscles in the brain. So again, they're very smart and they have very well-developed muscles. So they make good athletes like quarterbacks where they have to do intricate thinking and intricate uh, muscle, react muscle reactions. They tend to have terrible digestion from the mouth to the anus, including pancreas and liver function. Peristalsis is very weak. Food tends to sit like a rock in their gut. These are people who think hell is Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner where they have to eat a lot of food. They can't digest it. Their pancreatic up output, both exocrine and endocrine, the pancreatic enzymes, insulin, glucagon, very weak. Weak production of the liver uh, products like bile and bicarbonate, weak de detoxification aspects of the liver. Peristalsis, when the sympathetic system is strong, tends to shut down. L food literally sits like a rock in their gut. These are people that want a piece of fruit or a salad for lunch and feel fine for the next 10 hours. 
They tend to have very strong endocrine function, strong thyroid function, adrenal function. When the thyroid and adrenal is strong, blood pressure tends to go up. You've got more blood going to the brain. These people are thinking all the time, three in the morning, they wake up and they're thinking, thinking, thinking about the next day's work, whatever it may be. They have all this blood going to their brain constantly. Thyroid adrenal tends to increase the blood pressure. Thyroid and adrenals cause the breakdown of protein, fat, and carbs. So they have a lot of extra energy. They tend to be very lean because they're in a catabolic state, catabolic. They're breaking down their sto tissue stores. They tend to have weak immune function, particularly they're prone to bacterial infections. And they, 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 tend to, you know, they tend to have certain health problems. If they get too, like if a sympathetic dominant is under constant stress, they can end up hypomanic, where they don't sleep for days and want to run the world and start acting bizarrely. Their respiratory function will always be okay. They can end up with catastrophic heart attacks. If the heart is beating so hard, they can end up with ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. They end up with all kinds of digestive problems. Now, because of the sympathetic uh, obstruction of insulin synthesis and production, they tend to have high blood sugars because of insulin, uh, in, in, a lack of insulin, not the insulin resistance. We have too high blood insulin. They tend to have low insulin levels, high blood sugar because of that. Um, food tends to sit in their gut. They can get irritation from that, so they can end up with stomach ulcers. The lining of their gut tends to be weak. They tend to irritable bowel with constipation as a cause. They're prone to constipation. Prone to hyperthyroidism, hyperadrenalins, like Cushing's disease, where they're constantly breaking down their tissues, and prone to bacterial infections. Now, Pottinger also recognized that certain people had an in inherently genetically determined strong parasympathetic system and a correspondingly weak sympathetic system. And all these people, the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their strong parasympathetic, tend to be very highly developed and efficient, particularly all of digestion. And all the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their genetically determined weak sympathetic system, tended to be very weak and inefficient. And all the tissues, organs, glands, normally stimulated by their weak sympathetic system, including respiration, cardiovascular function, endocrine function, tend to be very weak and inefficient. And these people had their own unique psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and health profile. In fact, Cotton just said they're almost like a different species from the sympathetic dominance. They don't tend to be aggressive. Their sympathetic system is weak. They don't have a lot of adrenaline. They don't have a lot of norepinephrine. The quickest way to make a laboratory animal angry is to inject adrenaline into them. It's the defensive hormone. I remember, I remember once watching a Ge National Geographic special, I talk about this in my lectures, where there's a little warthog holding, on the Serengeti plane holding off a pride of about eight or nine lions. And you can see this little warthog, I mean, it's like the size of a golden retriever. He was just moving so fast. His sympathetic system was turned on 100%. And these lions were kind of slow, and they were a little nervous by him. I mean, I'm sure he ended up as sausage for the lions. But you could see his sympathetic system was turned on. Well, parasympathetics have a weak sympathetic system. They're, they're not aggressive. They're, their defense mechanisms aren't weak. They, they tend to be people, people. They don't, they don't like conflict. They don't like to deal with that kind of thing. They like to avoid conflict. They don't do well in school. Sympathetic dominants love regimentation, like to be up at 7.30 going to school. They like school. They like achievement. They like being good for the teacher. Parasympathetics don't care too much about that, but they can be extremely creative. You know, if you study the life histories of creative people, like Ernest Hemingway never even went to college. He ends up winning the Nobel Prize in Literature. Pa Pablo Picasso was a terrible student in art school, never finished. One of the most prominent, certainly one of the richest artists who ever lived. Thomas Edison was a scientific creative person. He was good at night, didn't, wasn't good in the morning like a sympathetic dominant, never finished high school. But he was extraordinarily creative. You know, people are now attacking his character. Well, OK, fine. But he was extremely creative. Parasympathetics don't do well in the morning. They tend to do well in the night. Sympathetics do well in the morning, do terribly at night. They want to be in bed by 8 or 9. Parasympathetics start waking up about 1 or 2 in the afternoon, do great, their best work in the evening, so the world is not really set up for them. But if they can find their niche, they can be very creative. They don't have good respiratory function. When the parasympathetic system is strong, you get bronchoconstriction, reduced efficiency of respiratory strains in the al alveoli. They don't exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen very efficiently. They will never make good long distance runners, nor should they try to be. They can make good linemen. They're not quick like a quarterback, but you know, they can be strong in a different way. They tend to have weak heart function, slow pulse, slow cardiac, weak cardiac contractility. Cardiac output tends to be low. Blood tends to pool in the gut and the skin. They tend toward low blood pressure. If they stand up too fast, they get weak. You know, the brain sits at the top of the head. Weighs two and a half pounds, uses 25% of all the body's energy, but you have to work against gravity to get blood up there. Blood pressure is low, as happens when the parasympathetic system is strong and firing. Blood pressure tends to be low. They have to get up slowly or they can get dizzy, faint, and foggy headed. They tend to have very efficient digestion. They could eat this table and that screen without even thinking about it. Their idea of heaven is Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. They have very strong peristalsis, strong release of all the various digestive enzymes and, and nutrients. And, 
various products like uh, bile salt from the liver, pepsin, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, olivares, pancreatic, digestive enzymes, insulin. They tend toward low blood sugar because of the overproduction of insulin. This can lead to insulin resistance over time, although if they eat too many carbohydrates, they end up with high blood sugar. They, but they have very efficient digestion. They have weak endocrine function, weak thyroid, weak adrenal function. They tend to store protein, fats, and carbs. Now, they're in a kind of a paradoxical, difficult situation. They have very efficient digestion, so they break down food very efficiently. Their absorption, utilization, assimilation, nutrients are very effective. And because the thyroid and adrenals are weak, they tend to store it all. Well, that's a good thing because it allows the body to repair and rebuild. Bad thing is because their digestion is so efficient and their hormone function is diminished, and thyroid and adrenal particularly, they're tending to store everything they eat. They tend to have strong uh, immune function. They are prone to certain illnesses. Now, a parasympathetic, if they get too parasympathetic dominant, can end up with extreme cataclys cataclysmic depression. The hypersomnic cataclysmic depression, where people are sleeping 14 hours a day and crying and life isn't worth living, suicidal. Parasympathetic can end up in that very se severe depression. That'll happen often, for example, if a parasympathetic uh, patient loses their job, they have nothing to do, sympathetic system is already weak, it turns off, they end up in a cataclysmic suicidal depression. They tend to get respiratory function because respiratory efficiency is very weak. So you get bronchoconstriction, they're prone to asthma. Um, when you bronchoconstriction, and now interestingly enough, when the parasympathetic system fires, it, those mucosal cells that line the alveoli produce a lot of mucus, but it doesn't tend to move, it tends to sit there, so it serves as a culture medium for particularly viruses and fungi. So they're prone to, uh, they can get flus, upper respiratory infections, pneumonia, tend to have weak heart function. They're prone to a heart failure if the parasympathetic system gets too strong. Um, they're prone to low blood pressure, which can be a problem. You know, again, the brain sits at the top of the head. We walk around standing. Parasympathetic is too parasympathetic dominant. You're not going to have blood to the brain with it, oxygen, nutrients. The brain is very metabolically active, as I said. They can f feel depressed, fatigued, spacey. Very often, extreme parasympathetic dominant, when they come into my office, it's, it's like they're looking through life through a fishbowl. Nothing's clear. They're foggy headed, spacey, et cetera. They tend to have efficient digestion if they end up too parasympathetic dominant, which can happen again if they lose their job and have nothing to do for six months. They can end up with diarrhea. They can end up with hypoglycemia and eventually because of the overproduction of insulin, insulin resistance. They can have an irritable bowel with diarrhea as the main component. Sympathetic dominance can have an irritable bowel because the food sits there, irritates the gut, and they end up with constipation. Parasympathetic can end up with hypothyroidism, hypoadrenalism, Cushing's, um, Addison's disease. And they tend to get uh, viral infections. Now, when the sympathetic system is strong, calcium tends to go in the cell membrane. Cell membranes get very tight, so viruses can't enter. Bacteria can reproduce in the bloodstream, viruses have to get inside the cell to reproduce. Sympathetic dominants have very strong cell membranes. Viruses can't penetrate. When the parasympathetic system fires, calcium leaves the cell membranes. The cell membranes get very leaky. That makes them prone to two things. First, viral infections, because the viruses very easily enter the cells. Secondly, they're prone to allergies. Sympathetic dominants have strong membranes. Allergens can't enter the cells that mediate allergic reactions, basal cells, mast cells, neutrophils, and lymphocytes. And the mediators of inflammation, like histamine, bradykine, and serotonin, leukotrienes, cytokines, can't leave the cell. So we all know people that smoke cigarettes, eat junk food, walk in back of a bus in New York City, they'll get allergic reactions. That's because their membranes are so tight. They can lead to other problems. Parasympathetic dominants with leaky cell membranes, prone to viruses, prone to allergies. And they're prone to certain cancers. They tend to get leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, sarcomas, which are connective tissue cancers related embryologically to immune cancer. They get the immune cancer. Sympathetic dominance get the typical solid epithelial uh, cancers, tumors of the breast, lung, stomach, colon, pancreas, liver, uterus, ovary. Um, never the twain shall meet. So they, the sympathetics and parasympathetics have unique psychology, physiology, biochemistry, and even health profile. Now the health profile. Now there's a third group that Pottinger recognized. And these are the balanced metabolic types, as he called them. And in these people, both branches of the autonomic nervous, nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic, tend to be equally developed, equally efficient. And all the various physiological groups, the physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestion, endocrine, immune function, tend to be equally as efficient. And they tend to psychologically, physiologically, biochemistry, tended to be midway between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. They weren't as aggressive as the sympathetics, but more aggressive, ambition, motivated than the parasympathetic. Not as creative as a para, better in school than a para, not as good in school as a sympathetic. They have good resp respiratory function. They can run, but they're not going to be as good a runner as a jogger, as a sympathetic dominant, but certainly better than a parasympathetic dominant. They have good, you know, average heart function, 
You know, under stress, it can increase its efficiency. When they're relaxed, it can decrease its efficiency. Their digestion is somewhere between. It's not as efficient as a parasympathetic dominance digestion, but better than a sympathetic. Food will pass through normally. They produce what we would call normal amounts of digestive enzymes, insulin, glucagon. Liver function is normally good. Peristalsis is pretty good, pretty efficient. They can break down utilized nutrients fairly efficiently. Good endocrine function, not as strong as a sympathetic, stronger than a parasympathetic. Good immune function. Now, a balanced person, Fortunately and unfortunately, can be prone to problems of either side. For example, a balanced person going about their life is exposed to stress at work or is terrible family stress. Their sympathetic system is strong enough it will turn on, if this is old Pottinger delineated this, and they can end up not sleeping, become irritable, and they want to go around kicking dogs and small children, and their spouses don't recognize them. Their respiration will be efficient. Their pulse will go up, uh, heart rate will go up, uh, blood pressure will go up, blood will tend to shunt from their skin and their gut. They'll tend to be a little paler under stress. More blood is going to the brain, so they're thinking all the time. Three in the morning, they suddenly start waking up. Digestion gets worse. Suddenly, they balance people normally can eat just about any kind of food when they're under stress. They suddenly find digestion is less efficient. They can't break down as food as efficiently. Food doesn't feel as well as their gut. They tend to get constipated. Their thyroid and adrenal turns on, so under stress, they tend to lose weight, and they'll be prone to bacterial infections, but not viral. Now, if a ba balanced person goes on vacation, they tend to be very conscientious. So they'll bring six books with them, playing and all the things they're going to do. They go on vacation. Sympathetic system turns off, as it does when we don't have activity to confront it. Parasympathetic will turn on. And they get a little spacey, a little foggy headed. The blood pressure tends to go down. They can't get as much blood to the brain. They start sleeping more because the parasympathetic system is turned on. Um, they don't read any of the books, and they tend a little depressed. They often go on vacation and get a little depressed. And they, all these things they want to do, they never get done. They go on vacation, they come back and have a flu or upper respiratory infection because the parasympathetic turned on. A balanced person's parasympathetic system can turn on enough to cause them trouble if it's turned on too much. Digestion will be efficient, endocrine function will slow. So they go on vacation, they're more parasympathetic system, dominant, so they're breaking down food efficiently. The thyroid and adrenals turn on, they're storing food, and they gain 10 pounds in two weeks. They're prone to viral infections. They're going to come back up a respiratory viral infection. Then they go back to work. Sympathetic turns on. Everything normalizes out. Um, the respiratory infections stop. The, uh, what, they don't, they're not breaking down food as efficiently. Thyroid and adrenals turn on. They start losing weight, and everything's back to normal. They don't tend to get cancer, but if they're under stress for a long time, they can get a sympathetic dominant cancer. The solid epithelial tumors, tumors, lung, breast, stomach, colon, pancreas, liver, uterus. If they go on vacation or lose their job for six months and the parasympathetic turns on, they're prone to leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma, sarcoma. So they can go either way. All these are extraordinary observations. Sounds like a lot of esoteric uh, neurophysiology. But what Pottinger was doing over a 40-year period was creating a model of human disease that was predictable, verifiable, and could predict what kind of disease a person would have and what you needed to do to get them. Padre got to the point that he began to believe that most human disease, minor and major, from allergies to cancer, was the result of autonomic imbalance. And in terms of balanced people with a balanced system, both systems tend to be inefficient. And he said the key to getting people well, whether it was a minor problem like toenail fungus or brain cancer, was to get the autonomic system back into balance because then all the physiological systems, respiration, cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, immune function, would work better. And all these symptoms work in harmony together in homeostatic equilibrium. The body works better. Whatever the disease is, allergies, brain cancer, fungus, go away. Simplistic, but a very, very fundamental, extraordinary model of human disease that any practitioner, whatever your background, can utilize in the day-to-day -day practice. Now, he, Prottinger got interested because he had this model where he saw in his practice certain people had a sympathetic system that was too strong, other people had a parasympathetic system that was too strong, other people were balanced, and in, both case, in these cases, both branches could be weak. And he began, to, he began to suspect the solution to many, if not most, human disease, psychological, physiology, biochemical, whatever kind of disease it was, was to get the autonomic system to be back in balance and to work more efficiently. Mm -hmm.